Alright, hello everybody and welcome to this, and this is the next in the X Roundtable. We're going to be discussing the decade of the 1980s. Um, now, a reduced cast joined me here, and the reason is, is the same reason that it's been um, a week later than usual. It's because I've had trouble getting the scheduling together. Scheduling didn't line up, so hopefully we can get them on for the next one in the 1990s. But I am joined by the two great people who joined me for the last one. I'm Carl, as always, and I'm joined by Andrew. Hello. And I'm joined by Ben. Hello, true believers. <laughs> Thank you, Stanley. Uh, <laughs> I'll just say this right now. I do sound different. I know I sound different. The reason is I'm now on a freestanding microphone because my headset broke. Um, so, but apologies if the sound quality isn't as good as usual, but I will do my best. Um, all right, then. So the 1980s, this was the decade where the X-Men, as we know it, pretty much came into being. I mean, not in terms of the stories, but in terms of the franchise. The franchise began here because with the Dark Phoenix saga, I think mainly from word of mouth, the X-Men became very, very popular. And coming out of that, it was one of Marvel's best-selling books. And from that point onwards, that set the stage for the rest of the decade that was that year, 1980. Um for what would come we'd get three spin-off books in this decade alone and that would just be the beginning as we all know today so i'll go around the table uh all three of us i'll go to ben first i'll say what's your take on the x your memories your thoughts on the x-men overall in the 1980s as i touched upon um last week you know i was really enthusiastic to uh, to get to this era because um for me it's one of my favorite eras for the x-men and um, it, for me, it, the, everything was on top form, you know, the success was building, um, the writing was good, the art was good, um, the character directions, you know, where the characters were going was great. And, you know, it saw a real boom in the X-Men, as you said, getting all the, the spin-off books and, um, you know, there was some uh, more big um, uh, storylines, you know, we mentioned last week, um, Dark Phoenix saga, and then, you know, coming on from that, we get, like, the days of future past and other big events, so, uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of the 80s. Yeah, and I know a lot of people out there right now say, God, we're living with the uh, the ramifications of that right now. Uh, it seems there's an <laughs> event every six months. But definitely, yeah, I think the Dark Phoenix saga was the trendsetter, not only in terms of it, it got the X-Men's popularity up, but I think it also, as you said, brought about the event story the big uh, multi-arcing over story that would become very very prevalent to the point that i don't remember the last time i saw a standalone x-men uh, thing so it's pretty much the norm right now and the phoenix saga was the beginning of that uh andrew what about you the 1980s i uh i like and dislike this thing i think this is where the x-men became it's where it started to become more confusing for readers because it bran like branched off into different books like new mutants x-factor and excalibur so, you know, you might need to pick up, like, when the crossover stuff, like, with the Mutant Massacre came along, you might need to have to pick up, like, you know, those other titles to understand what's going on. And, I t I, like you said, it's heading on to what's going on now. But overall, I think this continued off with what Claremont was trying to do, even with Burn Off the Book, where we got stuff like The Brood, we got stuff like, uh, who else came along? Uh, the Morlocks. All time is on. This is the other part of the X Men where they actually start inventing more original, new, just crazy villains for the X Men. Uh, and I don't know. I think this is this is my uh, other favorite section of the or decade for the X Men because you know a ton of just great stuff happened during this time. And like Ben said, just a lot of character growth and stuff happened here. Um, but also, I think this is the time where the X Men's teams start getting. Uh, a little crazier, like the guys like Longshot and Dazzler, and even Magneto. Uh, and yeah, I, I like this era. It's it's different, but it's I, I still like it. Yeah, I think when people say the X Men, I think this is, this is the era that most people uh, enjoy the most because this is where the X Men were pretty much hitting, hitting on all cylinders. Um, pretty much everything that wasn't introduced in the 70s was introduced in the 80s and every, the characters we got so many of them it's like you said the X-Men teams were always the X-Men team especially was always getting a roster change uh, it never really seemed to stay the same for a very long time I mean Cyclops would come in and out and things like that yeah and the thing you said about the uh, spin-off books that's nowhere near as bad as it is now and the thing that I always get when I read these old ones is that how well they were connected to each other 
say if the X-Men went off in an adventure in one book, the new mutants <laughs> wouldn't run into them in the mansion in the in their book uh, because they'd be off on their adventure. It's you don't get that now. You get Wolverine in G- Jesus the future, the hell, yeah. and and he's a vampire all at the same time. It's quite it's ridiculous. Um, but back then yeah. things actually connected up, but not to the level of like an event now where it's like if the book is New Mutants, you're going to read about those characters during that you know Inferno or whatever. Yeah. You're not, you're not going to have another chapter of the story that people who want to read about the X-Men characters have to go and read. Like, you might get reference, like, this is what happened to the New Mutants characters during this crossover, but you're not going to get stuff that's going to ruin the main X-Men book for you if you don't pick up New Mutants. And I think that's the main thing, is you didn't have to read New Mutants, but there was a lot of hints there that was, you know, a good crossover. And anything that you missed back then, the editing really was good at telling you what you'd missed in the little blurbs yeah. at the bottom, which... Again, it's something that uh, does not really happen anymore. I can see why they did it because it'd be easier for people to just buy it off immediately. It's like, hey, you want parts two and three? Go out and buy these books. And the other reason why it's just like, if you want to get interested in reading these other titles for this crossover, just you know, if you pick those books up and you're interested in these characters, it might be an easier way to get into you know that title. So I guess it's a yeah, it's it's a bad and good situation. Yeah. yeah, I think a case is, I think it's the reason, I mean, we'll get to this when we get to the modern era, but I think it's the reason that most people have turned to trades, because um, having to buy five books for one story is absolutely ridiculous. Whereas about this th- was ridiculous, though. Yeah, the time. Uh, exactly. It was an amazing story, but it was just all over the place. Um, yeah. But the, and the amount of other but back then, as I go back to the 80s, it was all tied in together. It was a case that... Uh, I think the Marvel Universe in general was all tied in. Um, like if Spider, yeah. if Spider Man was doing something in one book, the ed- the writer of that would mention it to the editor, and maybe the he'd swing by the X Men while he was doing this. Like stuff like that does not happen anymore, even within you know their own characters. As we were saying, Wolverine's probably the worst example of of a character that just is everywhere all the time. It's ridiculous. I, I think what they need to do with Wolverine now is just keep him like they can say he's an Avenger, but have him not always on a team because you know he's on x force and x-men just say like hey yeah it just makes the for... it just makes the x-men's place in the marvel universe even more ridiculous it got, it got silly he should have been a squirrel in the secret <laughs> <laughs> that would have actually made sense but yeah. anyway uh to go yeah let's go back to the 1980s so the 80s began uh with the dark phoenix saga in 1980 but coming out of that we got a few major changes cyclops was off the team permanently until you know, all decade, really. And, exactly. Yeah, and he would come back occasionally for the big stories, um, but he was off. And he met a woman who looked extremely like Jean Grey, who he was worried that actually was Jean Grey's reincarnation. But no, it turned out at this point to just be a woman who looked like Jean Grey called Madeline Pryor, and he would end up marrying her and having a kid and all this other good stuff that would really humanize, I think, the character of Cyclops and make him, you know, the most... He had responsibilities as a dad and a parent. Now, what he does later on, which we'll get to, is pretty much the most scumbaggish thing you could possibly do about that. Um, but at this point, no, it was it was good stuff. Angel rejoined the team at that point for a while, but he was gone pretty soon because he hated Wolverine, which was quite funny stuff. Uh, Kitty Pryor was now a permanent member of the team. And her introduction, and she was the young team member as a sprite at this point. And that's a terrible name. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. I just, as I said last time, I just think of the lemonade. And uh, <laughs> and then, of course, Storm really cemented herself in the role of the leader and her character. The Mohawk. Not yet. Yeah, not early on. We'll get to that in a second. But she would begin to change towards what would eventually become that uh, that dr- dramatic change in the character. So at this point, she was still Goddess Storm, but she was cementing herself as the leader. And of course, Wolverine um, would get two major things in the early part of the 80s. His brown tanned costume, which a lot of people uh, like, prefer over the blue and yellow version that most people like. And because I think, I think the reason that a lot of people like the tanned costume is because it... It's a little more serious. If that Made makes. it more edgier and darker, I guess you could say. Yeah, it's kind of like the difference between Batman wearing blue and wearing black. Sometimes the black just looks better. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing was that in one story, when they went to the Alpha Flight, he finally got a name. Logan was finally revealed in the early part of the 80s. It's amazing that he went, you know, all this time until he got really popular before we actually found out he's 
real name. And we found out that wasn't even his real name, but that the name that he goes by. So we'll start with the early stuff. The first stuff after the Phoenix Saga was the Days of Future Past. And this is one of those stories that has been ripped off and ripped off and ripped off. And one thing I saw people bringing up is that it's very similar to the Terminator. But it actually came out before the Terminator. So maybe James Cameron ripped off the X-Men. We don't know. But yeah, about robots taking over in the future, killing all the mutants. We actually see all the mutants, including Wolverine, believe it or not, because he wasn't as strong as he would later to become here, being killed in the future by Sentinels. And they had to stop the assassination of Senator Robert Kelly. And during that, we'd get the introduction of the brand new Brotherhood of Mutants, which would become the Brotherhood as most people, you know, see them in terms of the roster. Mystique would make her introduction in x-men comics and with her would be characters that would become infamous uh, blob from was the only one from the old team but apart from that we had pyro avalanche and destiny and later on also rogue so inter- interesting that only this character at this point became the x-men character that we know uh, with the brotherhood and this was their first encounter with them so i'll go to andrew first this time days of future past uh i actually this is one of my uh my, I, I would put this in my all-time favorite X-Men story or my second because it, all the stuff he's able to put in here for this, two, it's like a two-part story, right? Yeah. It, like he puts in Rachel Summers, uh, who's never been seen before, is like Jean Grey's daughter. Uh, he show just all these like new characters we haven't seen before put in there. Uh, future versions, like Magneto leading the X-Men in the future. Uh uh, the Sentinels basically killing Wolverine was a very just serious moment. And I think what the story accomplished was uh, it, it took its turn. as like, hey, what if the Sentinels really did basically kill so many mutants? What would the future be like? And this is one of those moments where like he like humans really do hate mutants, and this is what they they're gonna go. This, these are the lengths they're gonna go to to basically exterminate mutants. And this is one of those times where I actually kind of believed it, where it was just really serious. Like Canada going to war with America, uh, Japan basically planning to bomb like the US because the Sentinels were doing all this crazy stuff. It was just a very serious time for the X-Men and I like this. It's just one of my favorite X-Men events. And uh, it made me a fan of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. So, yeah. That's well, I, I think at this point they got rid of the evil title because as we say, it's a <laughs> yeah. little more serious. Ben, what about you? Yeah, um, I mean, I read this story a long, long time ago. It was one of the first X-Men stories I read, so um, I've always uh, been very fond of it, and it was a really, really good storyline. Um, you know, um, it puts uh, Shadow Cat, you know, Kitty straight away in as a major player, and um, and I really uh, connected with her then, then, you know, when she was first introduced, I was like, eh, but, you know... It made me um, a fan of the character and um, agreeing um, with what Andrew said as well, you know, um, it took a very more serious tone and, you know, like Wolverine's death, it was just like, whoa, you know, it's shocking to see something like that happen. And, um, you know, it set up a lot of things, um, like we've mentioned, you know, the New Brotherhood, uh, Rachel Summers, um, but as well... Um, I, I'd never really been a fan of uh, of the Sentinels, um, but it was this story that kind of made me realise, well, this is what uh, they are actually capable of and made them, in my eyes, more of a threat than they maybe had been. Um, uh, and it was a very clever plot too. I mean, you know, when you mentioned um, it, the similarities to Terminator, I'd never really thought about that before. But uh, for a comic book to be doing that in the, uh, in the early 80s, it was brilliant, a very serious... Uh, storyline and um, you know showing what uh, the consequences of being a mutant um, could be for these people so yeah uh, definitely a great story well I think the humans also felt those com- uh, consequences because I believe in the story the, the Sentinels turned against the humans as well which pretty much matches up to what happened when they were first introduced um, the thing with the Sentinels uh, I guess is a zeitgeist at the time where you think about it it seems that in the early to mid 80s they were extremely scared of technology and I think that's why it came, or at least they were worried about the ramifications of technology. And they explain why they exterminated the mutants, the humans too, or not? I think the same reason that they turned on them in the 60s. I think it, Master Mold just said, no, kill all humans. That's the only way to protect <laughs> them. Um, just the case that machines can't be controlled. And again, a very similar sort of thing to Terminator. Um, yeah, I think Kitty Pride was certainly thrust into the, the forefront here. She was the crux of the story. And I think that was um, good. And of course, the most iconic image 
that has lived on throughout all the sort of other media adaptations of this story is those gravestones with all the names on. That, well, that cover, basically. Yeah, that cover. Um, all right, then. Wait, wasn't this the first time they did the fastball special, too? Or is that early? I, pre- I think they did that in the se- 70s, I'm pretty sure. Um, oh. I think they did it when the- during the Phoenix Saga, I'm pretty sure. Oh, all right. Um, okay, so the next storyline after that, I think, was the introduction of the Morlocks. So does anybody have anything on the Morlocks? Yeah, it's been a while, but uh, this is like the first introduction of, you know, characters like Callisto and uh, Mikhail Rasputin as well, you know, uh, Colossus's brother. And um, and it gave some good storylines uh, for Storm as well, you know, um, her, uh, you know, later taking the leadership of, of the uh, of the Morlocks. But um, it, it has been a while since I've read it. But um, from what I remember, um, I enjoyed it, yeah. Was yeah. this a story that showed why she even got a mohawk? Or do you know why she... No, got... no, that was in, that was in Japan. Um... So basically, if you've ever seen the Morlock episode of the animated series, it's pretty much exactly the same, except they kidnap uh, Angel instead of uh, Cyclops. And the X-Men go down there, and uh, Storm and Callisto have a mortal combat, and Storm comes out uh, the victor, and from that point forward, she almost killed Callisto, I believe, she says. And at that point onwards, she was always a changed woman, and she would, that would be head towards the Mohawk version of her, and she would become the leader of the Morlocks due to this uh, fight and order people to let her go. But also during this, Kitty Pride would promise to marry Caliban, um, which would come up later on. Um, now, you notice I'm jumping from story arc to story arc, but that's very much how the 80s became, and that's this is where it already started with that. All right, so the next major thing, I believe, in 1982, was the introduction of the New Mutants. It would get be introduced, the first X-Men spin-off book, and it would be the first of many to come. Um, this was a case of going back to the X-Men's roots of having teenagers being trained by Professor X to be mutants, you know, learning their powers, all that kind of stuff. It would also sort of start the X-Men being a school again rather than just a superhero team and a bunch of other characters have been introduced that have become very fun to you know a, a generation a lot of people who are you know the the age of say a kitty pride back then or the kids of the day would love the new mutants because they were their point of view characters and the they would eventually become killers because of cable would yeah. yeah yeah true um but yeah we'll get to that later on but the whole introduction of here was the brood, was the story that introduced them, and it was revealed that Professor X actually got them together to be brood sealings because he was infected by the brood queen, and during this story arc, Professor X would regain control of his legs for the first time, because he would have a clone body made of him because his original body was destroyed by the brood queen, uh, him transforming into it. Um... So yeah, the the thoughts on the brood, which again talking about similarities to other sci-fi things at the time, were extremely close to the aliens uh, from the from Ridley Scott's Alien and Jim, James Cameron's Aliens, extremely similar. And this was also identically. Yeah, I think af- I think you can say definitely that they were inspired by them because it was after the, this point. Uh, but no, the brood and the introduction of the new mutants. I'll go to Ben first. Yeah, New Mutants was good in the fact that, you know, it took it back to the X-Men as a school. And, and like you said, we got introductions of characters, you know, who have, you know, gone on to be major characters. Uh, and, you know, that was fun. Um, but uh, as for the Brood, um, you know, I, I'm not really a big fan of them. X-Men in Space is kind of, like, split for me. Uh, I've always enjoyed, like, Shia storylines. But when it's come to, like, Brood and other alien races... It's never really grabbed me as much, but um, for me, New Mutants was a bit hit and miss. I think they got good when they found that right type of artist to bring that momentum to the book. But uh, for The Brood, I like them. I don't know much about them, but uh, the only thing I'm really confused about The the Brood is uh, I've seen covers where basically, like with Wolverine looking like a brood and Storm. Uh, Can you guys explain that to me? Because I don't know really... Well, they, the, like, the brood, like, the, re- the again, you know, going back to what happened to Professor X, they basically infect people, and instead of them bursting out their chest, what they do is they change you into one of them. So it's kind of like almost a zombie type thing. So the reason Professor X had to be cloned and got legs um, was because his body was destroyed from the inside out. So the idea is that it's kind of like, yeah, like zombies. Hmm. Or so 
How did uh, Wolverine and those guys turn back? Is they don't. They don't. I think that was just covers. Oh, all right. Uh, well, I mean, I think they were infected, but I think they fought it off. I don't. I don't think it ever got to the case that they it was irreversible, like Professor X. But again, I think that was just an excuse to give him his legs back. And he yeah. did actually help the team out for a while. He was, you know, a f on the field for a while after that, but he, you know, retreated back to his mentor role pretty soon, deciding to. Um, so I'm just going off the top of my head here. I can bring up a list in a second just to remind me. But I think the next major thing was the introduction of Rogue. And she came in and was a villain. Looked extremely different. Looked extremely older, to be honest with you. I think she had plastic surgery. <laughs> and touched Mish Marvel uh, in her book and took all of her powers and became, you know, flight and super strength. But at the same time, her psyche was affected. And she went to Professor X for help. We'd later find out this was kind of influenced by Mastermind, who was back. But she went and uh, gave up Mystique's brotherhood, which Mystique and Destiny, who were a kind of a surrogate parents, were extremely upset about. But she went to Professor X. And what's funny is, reading this, the characters were obviously like, no, you can't join her. She's a villain. What the hell are you doing, Professor X? And they don't want to accept her, and they hate her for a long time after this for what <laughs> she did. And but the, but the readers were the same way. I remember reading a letter column on the issue... A couple after Rogue was introduced, there was one that saying, How dare, how could I, Rogue join the X-Men? What the hell are you doing? You're crazy. This is the most stupid thing you've ever done. Again, hindsight is extremely <laughs> brilliant. Because, of course, she'd yeah. become one of the most popular X-Men of all time. And so, the introduction of Rogue, early Rogue people. I think, I, I get what you're saying with how people would react to that. Because I've seen that a ton nowadays. And some writers have backed up. But I think this is the time where Claremont just went with it and she he totally just developed her into being one of the most interesting x-men to me at least uh and like her whole uh just you know can't like touch anybody or else. i don't know i don't know too many stories about rogue but i do know that she's basically just one of the more interesting x-men characters that's been introduced in the 80s and she's been continuing to be more and more interesting as you know comics go along but, uh, Ben, I know you're a big fan of uh, Rogue from the comics, so you might know more than I do. So, do you know anything, any big stories that we might tell the readers to go out and find for the character? Or no? Um, I'm just trying to think. Um, the introductory but, story, I think. And then just yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, seeing um, her, it's interesting seeing her in her first appearance, which I think was in Avengers and then in Ms. Marvel's book. Um, and then comparing that to her in the Brotherhood, um, and definitely the story arc where she first goes into the X-Men, that, that's pretty cool. Um, but, you know, she's one of my favourite characters, and uh, you really uh, hit the nail on the head when you said that, you know, how well-developed she's become, and, you know, thank God Claremont did uh, develop her, because, you know, um, it, it's interesting uh, as well, you know, seeing um, someone... You know, we've always seen the X-Men as people, you know, who use their powers for good and, you know, learn to live with their powers. But for Rogue, you know, it's interesting to see a, a power which they really see as a curse. And, um, you know, her changing, you know, from the Brotherhood over to the X-Men, you know, uh, that's a really interesting storyline, too. And, uh, you know, the X-Men not trusting her. Um, it, it's great, great writing. And... Um, it's actually interesting how you said uh, about the backlash um, about Rogue joining the team, because uh, I was actually aware of that. Um, but um, uh, was there the same backlash when uh, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver joined Avengers? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Fan boys yeah. have never changed. It's just now they have a far more of a voice, and we're speaking for it right now. <laughs> mm. Uh, the only weird thing I'd probably say about Rogue would have to be her on and off relationship with Gambit and Magneto. Because I need it was like, I don't know, like 60, something like that. and Yeah, yeah. we'll certainly get to that uh, at, a, at a later date. But, and what's interesting about this in terms of speaking of her as kind of a harlot and a kind of, you know, sexy character. When she's introduced, she had short hair and she looked extremely different. Uh, she was she looked uh, evil, like the typical evil kind of character with no mm. pupils or anything. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and again... For me, it's great that it showed this would be the start of a lot of villains joining the team and being converted. And I think it was a, sh a showing that the X-Men you know, will take in and help all mutants despite what they've done in the past. And this character would be forever changed. And like other you know, villains who would 
maybe switch sides for a while in the future. Rogue was the one that was forever changed and forever became an X-Man from this point onwards. She never really returned to evil. Mm. Um, so even when her psyche was returned to normal, I think that's a, a, a testament to what how popular the character became uh, for the most part, but also what Claremont did to evolve the character. And this introduction just uh, is good stuff, good stuff. Again, it, uh, you know, the conflict on team here. I mean, Wolverine hated her for a long time because I think he was a real friend with Coward Ambers. Um, so speaking of Wolverine, let's go ahead and get into the next major thing, which was after Darth Vader's saga, the Wolverine became extremely popular. And there was a car ride where Frank Miller and Chris Claremont discussed the character Wolverine. And then they started working on a graphic novel, a mini series. Um, which would be the first ever Wolverine miniseries that would spark, you know, many others and a solo series as we'll talk about later on. But this would introduce the idea of him with his, all of his Japanese heritage and it would introduce him as the idea of a failed samurai. And from this point onwards, the Berserker Wolverine character got pretty much all of its depth. Um, during this story, we would get his love life with Marik Mariko and we did get the introduction of Yuriko, who would later become Lady Deathstrike. And then we'd also get the introduction of the idea of Kitty Pride and Wolverine as extremely good friends. Uh, Kitty Pride would join him on this later on, and their closeness that people kind of look to really began here as well. So from this point onwards, Wolverine as a fully fleshed out character as we know him today began. And he was now popular and extremely, you know, d well done creatively. Mm. So well, for this story, I think it was Frank Miller's best work, art, art wise, in general. Because uh, now you know, like, different. Because if you look at his work in like Dark Knight Returns, it's extremely simplistic compared to this. Yeah, it's like blocky. You know, like at the beginning, he actually went into like showing this little bit of a, a usual style most artists would go into, but it, it's still good. But then later on, he got his own style, and it it became blockier. I'm not a big fan of that one, but yeah. Came along with block here, but this is his best work to me in art wise. And uh, like you said, this is where he started becoming more just fleshed out the berserker type thing, and also with the Kitty Pride thing. I think this is basically the start of him basically becoming attached to the more younger X Men people, like with Rogue, Jubilee, and even now with a lot of the uh, younger mutants coming out. He's becoming, yeah. becoming their father. And I, think, and I think in the other media, they kind of twist. Uh the movies I'll, I'll say here i think they kind of twist it to make it sort of a romantic thing which is not the case oh, at all creepy. that's just creepy we'll talk yeah. about colossus in a minute but carry on <laughs> uh and speaking of graphic novels should we talk about god loves a man kills or... oh, we'll get to that in a second I'm, uh let's just cover the wolverine one first but uh i didn't know your became late death strike but uh yeah uh this this is basically one of my few favorite wolverine stories next to a couple others that nobody's probably ever heard of but yeah uh, the the graphic novel thing, yeah, I just really like the story. It's it's different. It was unique, and you know, it's basically when people look at Wolverine, they either think of the X Men or his Japanese heritage type stuff. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was a big uh, a big fan of this series too, as you said. It was very different, and you know, it really fleshed out Logan's character uh, into you know even more of the icon you know that he is today. Um, and you know, I'm a big fan of the Japanese arc, and I'm uh, I'm glad to hear that the next Wolverine movie will deal with this because um, you know it really shows um, uh, you know different sides to Logan, and um, you know it shows his reasons for being the way he is, and you know it also let us see different sides of him, you know, with his relationships with Mariko, and um, uh, again, um, in terms of Wolverine being that father figure, I think that's. Uh, a, a very clever uh, move character wise uh, just because you know it really did connect him more with the team and you know he had a, a lot of good partnerships you know what uh, you know within that father um type role you know with um kitty and you know more recently with you know some of the younger students like x23 so uh, yeah it, it was a good uh, that initial first miniseries, it was a good start for Wolverine and uh, an excellent one, really high standard. It was written really well and the art was really good. Definitely some of Frank Miller's best work in that series. Mm. Mm. 
Um, yeah, and uh, he would kill Mariko's father during this, and afterwards they plan to get married in the regular X. Again, even this mini series, this one shot, connected back to the main books. It's like, Christ, can you imagine that now? Um, so I think this also started him being basically a lover's man because he's been he's been been like. 20 relationships over his entire life. Oh, uh, how many Japanese women is he been with? I think he's got a <laughs> Um And Rogue. He's basically made up with Rogue, Jean, I, I don't know, what? Mystique, too. What? Like, Mystique? No, Rogue. Oh, there's this, uh, this one-shot issue where he and Rogue go to Japan, and oh, yeah. Down, oh, yeah, yeah. And he basically kisses her. That, oh, yeah. I've just re- yeah, you're right. That that's in this story I was just about to get into. Uh, oh. Yeah, I didn't. Re- I forgot about the romantic uh, element of that. Yeah, so they would go to. He'd send them a in- invitation to his wedding, and uh, Cyclops and Madeline Pryor would come along. And I, I always remember with this is the arc that made me like Madeline Pryor as uh, as much because there was that one bit where she introduced all the X Men, and then Kitty gives her Lockheed to hold, I believe. Which I think we've we've uh, skipped over, but uh, we'll get to him in a second. Yeah, um, and she just you know, look on her face. She goes, Scott, what the hell have you brought me into, kind of thing. And uh, yeah, this would change a lot. Um, you know, just a one-off X-Men trip to Japan. How much did this change? I mean, Rogue and Wolverine, as you said, they had that moment uh, where they went off working together and they became close. And for that point onwards, Rogue was an accepted member of the team because when she showed up with them in Japan. Wolverine was like, what the fuck, who's this? You know. Um, <laughs> what are you and, doing here? Yeah, exactly. I didn't invite you. So, uh, but yeah, but they became really good friends. And then the other major thing was Storm's conflict. Um, she would end up walk- going off with Yuriko and coming back with a mohawk and uh, in leather punk clothes. So I'll, I'll give it to you guys. Uh, your thoughts on, and of course... Um, just quickly, Wolverine doesn't end up getting married because Mastermind manipulates Mariko's mind and she leaves him at the altar. So oh. it's all for nothing. But either way, uh, your thoughts on this whole um, changes in terms of Rogue and Wolverine's uh, friendship beginning and in terms of Punk Storm. What's your thoughts on that storm? Uh, punk Storm. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, it gave her that like 80s look. I don't know why she chose it. I guess she became more of a rebel, but, you know, she still seemed like a happy person later on. I don't know. Was she? Was she more aggressive later on? Or she... Well, she got over it. Okay, kind of went back to who she was after this. At this point, she was just kind of like, okay, I've killed people, and I don't feel good about it, so I'm not the person I was. And she just kind of went through an identity crisis and did this. She basically like acting all emo-ish, where she was just yeah, like, she was emo-ish, but she was kind of just like, I'm now getting rid of all my stuff. Like she destroyed all the like, flowers in her attic and replaced it with furniture. She was like, now I'm becoming totally, you know, Western, basically. <laughs> yeah, it was a weird time for Storm. It was different, but it was, it was one of those like. Memorable things about Storm. That that was her look in the 80s, and that's how we remember her in the 80s. Uh, but with Wolverine and Rogue, it kind of cemented Wolverine as that guy. Like, if you want to be accepted into the X-Men, you need to go out and hang out with Wolverine some more. Then, you know, <laughs> others might accept you. But, yeah, it, it, it cemented more of uh, as Wolverine as that central figure in the X-Men. And, you know, I, I guess it's a good thing. I wish more other characters would be more central. But, yeah, it was a good move for Wolverine and the X-Men, basically, yeah. Yeah, I agreed. It made Wolverine more of a major player, and like you said, a central figure. And, you know, the the relationship between Logan and Rogue I've always enjoyed, but um, I, I like it the more, you know, as friends. Uh, the romantic side, especially in that one shot, was like, huh? But, yeah, no, they, um, they do have a good dynamic together. Um, um, and as for Storm, uh, yeah, the look's iconic, but for me, it it was all very silly. I mean, uh, it it felt a bit out of character for for uh, Storm. Um, I, I know she'd been through a lot, uh, but I, I was glad when that whole punk phase uh, went out. It just for me, it was very out of character for Storm. And you know, it's interesting when you said maybe they were westernizing. Her. Um, was that necessary? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, 
I, 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 I see that's the thing. I when I went when I went back to it, it's because I think a lot of us of our generation were introduced to the X Men, you know, through the animated series, through the movies and stuff like that. And then you go back and you're like, "What the hell? This isn't Storm." And you kind of have this reaction, like, "Grow your hair back, woman," and kind of thing. But I think for fans of the time, this was something new and something interesting that were different. And in fact, there are a lot of people out there who really are big fans of Storm during this era because this sort of jacket leader character, this is where she became sort of the this was her look for when she was the leader of the X-Men. And for a lot of people, this represents Storm as a badass. I think that's, you know, one of the things that people like about this era of Storm. Um, I can not, see that. Yeah. That's not to say I don't think, I think she should shave her head now, but I think people, I think more of the character from this point could be um, shining through a little bit. I think she's become a little bit too weak nowadays. I think yeah. the I think the era kind of was good um, for raising her status. You know, it was more Storm the leader. You know, she was a major player in the X Men. She she was the leader of the Morlocks. That was good, and you know, it did give her a bit more attitude. And while she did lose that punk phase, you know, it, it's still cool to see Storm every now and again just completely cut loose. Um, so yeah, it did boost Storm. But as I said, I just felt there were some moments that were just slightly out of character for her. I think there was even a moment with her being a leader where uh, her and Cyclops even like fought to be leader oh. of the X Men, and she won. Mm, so yeah. I think it's basically the writer saying, "Hey, over the years, Storm's become an even better leader than Cyclops." So you know. Well, way. yeah, the whole thing was to do with Madeline Pryor at the time, which would uh, come up later on. Uh, but we'll get to that. Mm. Um, first, we skipped over it, but uh, yeah, well, thank you for mentioning it. We'll come back to it. God love man kills. Now, this was one of the preliminary dark X-Men stories. This is the one of the ones that was the first sort of very serious issue with the whole mutant hatred and stuff like that. And to bring in religion, I'd imagine, and the guy that's a religious figure, I think that was an extremely controversial thing for the time. And But this would become the basis that would become the second X-Men movie, which is, of course is the, is the best by most people's standards. So in many ways, this could be looked at as one of the greatest X-Men stories, because not only was it great in itself, but it also... It was the introduction of a character that would become the crux of a even greater movie down the line. Um, so, Andrew, what mm. about This is one of my favorite X-Men stories uh, because, you know, like I said, the Sentinel story, it took the serious tone with everything that was going on with the X-Men but brought it to another level. Like, you saw stuff like with Night... You'd see stuff like with Nightcrawler basically planning on biting a guy's neck up close, but he's basically doing it as like a torture thing. And the entire time, we're just like, are these X-Men really going to kill people? And it's basically from, like, if you're in the point of view of, like, a normal person and you saw these mutants, and they kind of show the scary aspect of it. Just like, hey, you might you might get extremely just, I don't know, murdered from these crazy mutants. Uh, then you have the, the conflict between Magneto and uh, the X-Men, and that was really cool to see. Uh, but basically, you'd have these serious things like with the religious leader. I forgot his name. Striker, was it? Yep, Striker. Uh, you had stuff with Striker basically using Xavier to kill off half the population on the planet of mutants, which is pretty big. Uh, really just crazy if you think about it. And, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to keep talking more about it, but it was just one of those stories that I just, I'm just i really fond of and I really like it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the X-Men's always been good uh, on commenting on, you know, the social status of the world and, you know, uh, commenting on, you know, religious and a religious viewpoint on, um, you know, on the whole mutant existence, you know, it, it's very interesting, you know, because um, people, you know, even today, you said, you know, if someone said, you know, there were aliens, it would... Um, it would cause, you know, a lot of religious debate. And so the existence of mutants would obviously uh, stir things up. And so what was interesting is it was a real social commentary. And, you know, we weren't seeing the X-Men going out fighting, you know, these costumed villains for once. You know, it was a, a very human, a very serious threat and a very well-written piece. The Like, these guys who, like, shoot kids outright just out in the open just because they're mutants. Like, hey, this guy's a mutant, it's okay. And just like, it was scary. You know, it's kind of freaky. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, other stuff that would happen in, uh, during this mid-80s period would be Storm lost her powers um, when the 
military frame of Rogue. That was the introduction of Forge. And she would actually be on the team for a while without her powers until she would eventually get it back during a, a whole magical story arc with Forge. And when, uh, It's uh, interesting to think how much of a fleshed out character Forge used to be, but now he's just kind of the tech guy, at least he was before he died. Or villain or whatever the hell he is now. Okay, so yeah, the, there'll be a lot of introduction of other villains as to about that. Um, the Hellfire Club kind of became a new mutants villain at this point, uh, as did Emma Frost, because we got the introduction of the Hellions and the Massachusetts Academy and things like that. They would become the rival rivalry for Xavier's students and all that good stuff. Mm. And... Then we'd get the reintroduction of Jean Grey. Now, this was controversial at the time. This We spoke about this during the Dark Phoenix saga. The retcon is that the Phoenix was never Jean Grey. It was a clone of Jean Grey. And the real Jean Grey was always at the bottom of, you know, Jamaica Bay. So Jean Grey, despite popular belief, never died until she actually died during Graham Morrison's run. It was just, you know, a fake out. Um... Now, of course, later on, she'd merge with a Phoenix personality along with Madeline's, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but at this point, I think it does kind of weaken some parts of the Dark Phoenix saga. But overall, I think for readers, it was interesting to have Jean back, at least to see what the character dynamics would be. But for me, I think Jean Grey's better off dead. I think she's a better character when she's dead, or the Phoenix. And I think this was a mistake, but... When she's back, uh, the explanation was pretty solid, and when she's back, she's back, so it's good to have her there, I guess. Yeah, like you said, it did ruin her final send-off in the Dark Phoenix Saga story, so it did it did lessen things, but, you know, yeah, for a while there, fans were just accepting it, just like, hey, Jean's back, okay. Uh, That'll be the first of many, many, many resurrections. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's the way comms going out of this. But uh, like you said, I actually, with, with, with us talking about Jean Grey, uh, with Madeline Pryor, how exactly did she become this demonic type of person? We'll get to that. Oh, but yeah, it did lessen things. And with Cyclops, with Madeline Pryor, you know, breakups for no reason. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was bad. Yeah, it, it was cool in the fact that, yay, Jean was back, but as you said, it took away um, from the ending of the Dark Phoenix saga. Um, uh, you, you know, yeah, she was back. That was great. But, you know, it did, as you say, start off many resurrections uh, in Marvel, not just for Jean, but for many of the characters as well. Um, and um, I think people would, were um, kind of readjusting to the idea of a new team again. Uh, and so it's debatable whether it was really necessary to do uh, that at the time, you know, bring Jean back. Um, so it, it was a hit and miss. Maybe, you know, a part of me thinks, well, obviously it's great because Jean is back, but was it done just so they could make X Factor? Who knows? Absolutely, yes, it was. I can say that right now. Um, the idea came about... That they wanted, they said, okay, we've got Angel's doing nothing, Iceman's doing nothing, Beast really isn't fitting on the Avengers right now, he's kind of more of an X-Man, but we've got enough members of the X-Men team, that doesn't stop them now, but, you know, um, and they decided we want to have a team of the original X-Men, you know, people are getting fond of this character, so let's have Cyclops rejoin a main team, and we'll have a spin-off book called X-Factor. Now, somebody went, well, Jean's dead, so we can't use her. So, of course, they came up with this just to bring her back for X Factor, which is kind of... I think that by the fact that Jean's dead again now, I think Cyclops is a better character when Jean's not around, and I think it Jean's a better character when Jean's not around. I think she's better as the kind of um, shadow over the X-Men. I, I, I don't know what it is, but I just think Jean's a better character when she's dead. And for that reason... Uh, yeah, but let's get on to it. X Factor, the early X Factor, where it would be the original X Men team, and they'd get they believe themselves to be kind of Ghostbusters kind of thing, but for mutants, uh, they'd uh, take mutants in and pretend they were a mutant extermination or a mutant capture organization, but really they were taking them in and forming their own kind of new mutants out of Rusty and Boom Boom, the introduction of Boom Boom. Um, Leech, I think, was with them at one point as well. Um, all this sort of stuff like that. Or was it Artie? I'm not sure. One or two. I um, think it's Leech and Artie, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, they were all there in their basement. 
Um, so <laughs> thoughts on the early X Factor guys? Uh, I guess this is basically their callback to saying, hey, we, we like the old 1960s X-Men team. Let's bring them back. And they basically continued off with doing stories like that. So I, I think it was a cool move. Uh, it did bring about Apocalypse, which is cool. But, uh, you know, I, I thought it was just fun storytelling. It wasn't anything special, but it was all right. It, it's been a while since I've read the X-Factor. And, you know... Um, it, it was maybe a publicity stunt, you know, hey, the original X-Men are back, and yeah, that's okay, you know. Um, it, it was a good little series, but, you know, it doesn't really stick out in my mind of anything great. You know, it was good to have them back, but, you know, x Factor's never really been one of my favourite books, so maybe I'm biased, but um, it, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't anything groundbreaking in my no. opinion. I, I think with me, the thing was, I read the first couple to see the kind of Jean Grey, many Cyclops again and all that kind of stuff. And uh, after that, I just kind of fell off it because I was like, it just was not interesting to me and it was not connected to the other X-Men books in any way. So I was just like, Psh, yeah, whatever. Um, now, what was interesting about this was it was written by Louise Simonson, who uh, would go on to write New Mutants later on, much to chagrin of many people. Um and she was an editor of the X-Men, so she knew the characters, and she took over here. So, really, the introduction and reintroduction and the telling of the resurrected G. Grey was told, not by Chris Claremont, which kind of leads, leads Cruz to the fact that Claremont wanted to keep her dead. Um, so, it's, it's stuff there. Um, I think the book got a lot better when Walt Simonson started coming on, and, yeah, Apocalypse started dumping him. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's let's cover that. The introduction of Apocalypse. Um, well, actually, no. First, I, I have something I want to skip over. Is Deadbeat Dad Cyclops? Okay, so he marries Madeline Bryant. He has a kid with her, and he gets a phone call that says the Jean Grey's back. So what he does is he up and leaves them both, and just goes and joins the uh, joins an X Men team again, and just leaves his uh, wife for months on end. Yeah, it was a pretty. Jackass move, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, this is just like... It kind of showed Jean Grey at the Cyclops was only with Madeline because he looked, she looked like Jean Grey. And now the real McCoy was back. He's like, screw you, Madeline. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. He was on the rebound. It, it, it was very silly. I mean, I've never been a fan of Scott and actions like that. It's kind of a reason why. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean... What's funny here is if that she had remained a regular human, I think they would have had to deal with the implications that, hey, I mean, Hero is kind of a jerk. And I think part of the reason for what happened with the Goblin Queen later on is to absolve Cyclops. So it's like, oh, it doesn't matter that you did all this to her because she was an evil bitch anyway. As <laughs> I think that if you make her into a 2D tuber villain, it kind of was to let Cyclops off the hook because otherwise he would have to deal with this shit that he did. Um, but moving on from that, because they certainly did, one of the things that really bothered me about X-Factor the other going was they're in the same city as the X-Men and it takes like into like issue 50 for, the ma for them to not only meet X-Factor but also realize Jean Grey's still alive. Really? Jeez, yes. It's like literally 50 issues in before they meet. Hey, yeah, we've been undercover this entire time, and hey, Jean's back. Well, what? <laughs> yeah, like, during, during Mutant, Mutant Massacre, uh, Wolverine, like, smells her, and then he's like, ah, that's, that can't be true. And then he meets her again later on, and he's like, oh, my God! Uh, uh, but anyway, so, yeah, that was the next major thing, was Mutant Massacre. Now, this, speaking of Dark, uh, the marauders went into the this was the introduction of Sabretooth into the x-men books uh they all went into the cave head under Sabretooth for them and killed just about all of the morlocks um callisto was really the only survivor of the main roster along with caliban and uh the x-men went in there and during this kitty pride was injured kurt had a religious crisis and uh so Cycl uh, colossus was injured so for a while colossus was off the team but he would come back but this was the uh Kitty and Nightcrawler's last hurrah as part of the main X-Men team for, for a very, very, very long time. Uh, Didn't Colossus kill somebody during this? Or yeah. did he just... He, oh killed, he killed him, and then he was like, what did I do? But he's like, didn't you kill Proteus as well? He's like, yeah, but this was an actual person. Um, but He was he, real. <laughs> yeah, but then the, the guy, I think it was Riptide, ends up being alive anyway, so he's just like, oh, never mind. Um... But yeah, Colossus became a dark character after this as well. So a lot of interesting things going on with the characters. So 
And also during this, uh, this actually leads into the introduction of Apocalypse, which we'll get to in a second. Angel will be strung up and his wings will be damaged irreparably, which would be the beginning of his turn into Archangel. So, uh, Mutant Massacre, people. Yeah, I, I haven't read this, but I, I know what happens during this. Yeah, uh, you know, it's Nightcrawler and his religious stuff. Wasn't this basically the beginning of him basically becoming more religious? or just? Yeah, it was basically like, I can't do what I do and be as Christian as I am. And, and the fact that he met guys like the Beyonder and stuff like that, it's like, does that mean that God doesn't exist? Did I meet God? And all this sort of stuff, so... <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I think I have not read this. I've heard mixed things like like some people say, oh, it's really boring, or A, it's like it's really fun and action packed, or C, you know, the mo like stuff happens, but it's not as interesting as people say it is. Like, you know, characters change. I don't know, like Wolverine and Sabretooth start fighting. Like this is the big famous matchup. Uh, you know, and uh, who else was it? Uh, Yes, yeah, Storm deals with the Morlocks. You know, with her being leader, she might be really affected by this. Uh, I think even Thor shows up, too. Yeah, he uh, does. Um, what's interesting here for me is that a lot of the characters change. And it shows Claremont had balls. Like, he was just like, okay, I'm going to get rid of half the roster. Like, of all <laughs> these popular characters, he's like, what? You're going to what? And I'm, I'm going to put some B-level team members in instead. You could, I, I have to imagine the editors must have looked at him like he was... Could you imagine if a guy turned... They would not do that today. Could you imagine in the climate of how comics are now, somebody turned around and said, okay, I'm going to take Cyclops and Frost and Wolverine off the X-Men team. You are goddamn not! <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to kill you, or something yeah, like that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so that was a ballsy move, I have to say, to do this. And it, I really enjoy it as sort of a dark storytelling, but I think for a lot of people, this is the end of the golden era because from this part onwards, we get a kind of very subpar, subpar X-Men team compared to, you yeah. know, the team that we've become used to. Yeah, and I think it also began the crossover. This began the first crossover for the well, X-Men. Yeah, yeah, the X-Factor, I think even goddamn Power Pack. Was tied it, tied it to this. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. Power pack. There's one. There's one cover where Wolverine's picking up one of power packs. Oh, I saw that. He's smoking. He's like threatening. He's not to like stab. threatening him to stab. It's like Wolverine is the best he has. What he does. What he does is, <laughs> is stab kids. Uh, all right. <laughs> so Ben, uh, your thoughts on Mutant Massacre? Yeah, I like Mutant Massacre, but yeah, it's weird. You know, Andrew's saying uh, you know he's not read it, but he's heard you know. Uh, things happen but it's not the greatest and that that's kind of my feelings on it i mean you, absolutely you know it makes a lot of ballsy moves you know um you know getting colossus shadow cat night quality you know they're badly wounded you know angels you know you know badly badly hurt in this um and so you know it was ballsy to change up the team and you know really diminish them and um, but I also in, enjoyed seeing, you know, characters like um, Sabretooth, as you said, his big fight with Wolverine was great. Um, and, you know, I think Thor showed up as well, uh, along with Power Pack, which was cool. Um, so, yeah, it, it was it was an it was an interesting story and it, it was re real dark as well. And, you know, like we mentioned, um, Nightcrawler questioning his religion and stuff. I'm glad that, you know, we can bring these kind of things into comic books it was a it was a really well written story and uh, i also enjoyed uh, seeing characters like psylocke uh, having a bigger role in uh, in uh, in the x-men and you know she was uh, she was definitely uh, involved in this story so yeah uh, it was good and you know it had some real consequences this story as well you know and um, it's like you know it's not a, a, and you know everything goes back to normal at the end you know uh, you know, it really changed things up. Um, but I'd agree with you as well, Carl, when you say, you know, it's kind of the end of the golden era because, you know, it was a change up in team and, you know, it was getting closer to the 90s, which uh, for me is my least favourite era of the X-Men. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I think it was an interesting story, if, you know. Um, so why we're here, why don't we cover a couple of characters um First of all, Psylocke, uh, which you just mentioned, was introduced during the whole thing where they introduced Mojo and Mojo Vision and Longshot and all that stuff. I was never it was just weird. I don't know. Yeah, I, I was never a big. Yeah. I was never a big fan of Mojo. Oh, uh, was ridiculous! Why do they keep bringing him back for all the cartoons? I really do not know. Apparently, he's popular for some, <laughs> for some reason. 
Um, but yeah, I'm not a big fan of him either. But uh, Psylocke at this point was British Psylocke. Uh, she would there with a cape and armor and stuff like that. So she was not the badass stripper ninja she would later become. <laughs> she's always had that really stripperish uh, costume, which doesn't not, affect. Not at this point. She was just in like a purple purple armor at this point with a cloak. With the cloak, yeah, yeah. But you know, Psylocke. Yeah, you don't see too many British Asian people nowadays. But yeah. Well, she wasn't. She wasn't. She was she transferred was. into Kwanam. <laughs> yeah. At this point, she was actually, you know, Caucasian. Um, oh. Yeah. And she was a very different character. She was much more timid, and she wasn't sure what she was doing. She had much lighter purple hair as well. Hmm. Which is interesting when you think about it. Is how much chance do you think that it had that the person whose body she transferred into also had purple hair? <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Yeah. The- Yes, there's just that many people out there with purple hair, even ninja assassins. It's unique. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, Cyclops' character would change later on because, as I said, she would be injured. But then Quanim would come along, who was like a comatose person, and they switch minds, which would come again in the 90s. But then at this point, Psylocke, this is just an excuse to people didn't like Psylocke's look, and they were getting more towards the kind of, hey, you know, all women in comic books have to look like, you know, supermodels. So let No pants. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they changed Psylocke into this ninja. Now, I'm a huge fan of this version of Psylocke because it's kind of the when you think of Psylocke, I think obviously the Psy knives and the mm-hmm. and the badass ninja nature of her. Um, the costume, of course, is far more revealing, but it's more iconic because, of course, that's the Psylocke we all think of. So yeah. this is Psylocke as we know her, but um, the change of the character, I think, was motivated more from aesthetical point of view and for the fact that they were like, hey, we can't just have a person who's a telepath. We've got to have somebody who can stab people with psychic knives, you know? Yeah. Right. They've really developed her. I mean, I've always been a fan of Psylocke, you know, both when she started out, um, you know, in as British um, Psylocke, going into Quan on Psylocke. I mean, she's had a lot of character progression, you know. Um, you know she's you know she's gone as you said from a timid girl to you know this kick-ass ninja um, and you know her powers have developed too and um, let's not forget uh, thanks to Psylocke you know we've also had uh, other characters like her brother Captain Britain and um, Excalibur you know kind of you know with uh, Captain Britain and Nightcrawler and uh, Rachel um, you know so that was cool but um, yeah I, I, I I do prefer Ninja Psylocke, as you said, but uh, I don't know why I've just always be, been a big fan. Always. Yeah, I forgot about the whole introduction of Rachel Summers. I think that's the thing with the 80s. Is so much happened. Like We're only covering the major story arcs, but Jesus, there's so much that happened. Um, Small stories are where the big stuff happens, too. But yeah, yeah. stuff happens. Everywhere. So, has anybody um, got any thoughts on, first of all, the... Excalibur. Let's let's get into that. Well, I never understood Kitty and, and Nightcrawler's reasons for leaving. It was I like, think they just wanted to be in some other teams. They were just like, oh, we're injured, so now we're not going to be on the X-Men anymore. So once they recovered, they went off to England to join Captain Britain for a book I was never a fan of um, because it was a little too silly for my tastes. But what about you? Hang on, right back. Excalibur was okay. I mean... Um, I agree that uh, my Kitty and um, kind of went off. I was never 100% totally sure one. Um, but, you know, I did like Captain Britain's original series. I'm sorry about that. It's like the third time my dog's done that. Uh, but, all right, were you guys saying something? Or, no? It's all right, Ben, just finish up your thoughts, and then, Andrew, you go. Uh, oh. so, yeah, so, yeah, um, I liked Captain Britain's original series um, uh, featuring himself and Megan. Uh, so for him to get his own team, it was cool. I agreed it was a little silly, but, um, you know, it was cool seeing, you know, Kitty and Kurt back in, back in action. And, you know, it later saw with the characters like Pete Wisdom. Uh, yeah, I didn't mind Excalibur. It, again, it's like X Factor. It wasn't totally bad, but it wasn't totally great either. But it, it was good for what it was. Um, well, I, I, I think I, I really enjoy those fun off the wall stories sometimes. And I do enjoy seeing, you know, Britain, thanks to you guys, finally get like a superhero team. Uh, you don't see too many Britain superhero teams nowadays, but, uh, yeah, these guys, it, it was more different. I mean, you have some beautiful artwork by Alan Davis and, uh, some great writer like Chris Claremont every now and then, but you know, it was, it was different. 
it was very yeah it was different i don't know different. what else to say about it different definitely um different from the rest of the x-men books um now one other thing is as we brought up rachel gray remind me how she ended up in this continuity because jesus this was the start of one of the reasons people can't get into x-men for a lot of the reasons is how just how many alternate futures do you have how many people from alternate futures exist in the actual time okay whatever uh so g rachel gray how the hell did she get from days of future past well I know a couple things. I'm not entirely sure, but uh, I. <laughs> that's a very different thing to talk I about. I have read this. I just. I can't remember. <laughs> I, I, I'm just checking the encyclopedia, and it says she used her powers to travel through dimensions and time to the present day reality of the X Men we know. Oh, okay. She just used the Phoenix. I. And when she got there, she was like, hey, Dad, to cycle up, cycle up, what the who, who the hell are you? you? Well, I do know with her, she did have a nice arc with her and her mom, Jean, because uh, Jean, uh, they, 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 they did a sequel with uh, Days of Future Past, but like Days of Future Present. And like throughout that entire story, uh, like Rachel and Jean Grey are basically going off and off, like back and forth saying, hey, don't you love me, Mom? And she's like, I, I don't know what to say because you're my age already. And, you know, it, yeah, they did affect Rachel Gray with her mom, and they did some interest, interesting stuff with her. But as to how she got back to present time, I have no idea. Yeah, and before Jean came back, she was dressing up as Marvel Girl and took that name, and everybody was like, and Cyclops was like, what the hell are you doing? And there was a lot of uh, friction with that character. I think Glamon liked her a lot. Um, all right, then. So one of the other things was the evolution of Rogue um, to Rogue as we more know her. She started growing her hair out, for one thing. It was kind of really 80s at one point, but she started growing her hair out, so she became much more of the you know, the, the good-looking character. And at the same time, we got that introduction of Nimrod and the other cent uh, Sentinels and things like that, where she we first saw for the first time, she went around and touched everybody, took all their powers, became super duper rogue and kicked the crap out of Nimrod. Uh, so thoughts on Nimrod's and thought Nimrod and thoughts of the introduction of Ro with the evolution of Rogue, because for me, this is the thing that the movies have always missed. And the only series that ever really took advantage of it, apart from obviously the nineties series, uh, was evolution of, of how powerful Rogue can be. Agreed. Um yeah, I think I don't know. I haven't read too many stories with Rogue in it, but yeah, with her fighting Nimrod, that was like a big step. Like, oh, she can do that. Because uh, I mean, I think Nimrod was basically kicking the crap out of Juggernaut not too earlier before. And like when she came along and she absorbed all these people's power, she was just like, oh my god, she's kicking the crap out of Nimrod. Oh, jeez. Uh, but yeah, it, it kind of cemented her as like the powerhouse X Men that they really need. But yeah, it made her more interesting stuff. Um, I, am I right in thinking it was the 80s um, when we had the revelation that Mystique was her mother? I think uh, it was yeah, yeah. Late late 80s. 80s. Was certainly, she was certainly her surrogate mother before she joined the X-Men. Like That was very clear. Mm. Uh, she, It was clear that she wasn't her actual mother. Oh, mm. yeah, no, yeah, yeah. She was the surrogate mother. And, um, yeah, um, sorry, I was just getting a bit confused. There, but I think I was mixed up with Nightcrawler for a moment. Sorry. <laughs> I think Rogue and I call our brother and sister. Yeah, there, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Mystique was her uh, foster mother, and yeah, yeah, Mystique was the birth mother of. Uh, Should we also uh, cover the Magneto thing? Like, yes, we're so, certainly we're gonna. Um... I just try to take breath. This first thing is, I just thought uh, that we haven't covered this, the Kitty Pride Colossus relationship. I think it's good. Nowadays, it's good. I like it, but uh, I've always have been a fan of it, and it's and it's good nowadays because, of course, Kitty's overage. Um, <laughs> oh, the age thing. Okay, never mind. Because let, let's just think about this for a second. Colossus was in his mid twenties, let's say. Kitty, when she was introduced, I believe was probably thirteen, fourteen. That's a bit weird. Um, yeah. <laughs> now, of course, nothing ever happened between them uh, until she became an adult later on. Uh, so that was good. You know, it showed the Colossus had some honor in him. But I always found this a little bit weird, especially later on where Colossus actually got with someone during Secret Wars. And he came back and Kitty was like, you got with somebody? And then like Wolverine, well, one of my favorite X-Men stories, uh, Wolverine takes Colossus to a bar and lets Juggernaut beat him up for it. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's good stuff. Um, but... 
for me, it was always kind of like, you're a little young. You know, you can't blame him for getting with somebody of his own age. So I found this funny shit weird, but I'm a fan of it now because Kitty's of age. <laughs> I find it kind of ironic that Wolverine's the one to stop Colossus from having a relationship like that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, I mean, I'm a big fan of them now. Um, what they've done in the modern era with them is great. But yeah, at, at the time it was a little creepy. But I remember when I first read Secret Wars, I was exactly the same. Uh, when um, when Colossus got with that alien, I was like, wait, isn't he with Kitty during this period? It was all kind of like, uh, I don't know. It was the start of the uh, the um, soap opera-ish uh, dramas, I guess. Yeah. All right, then. So the other thing, as Andrew brought up, was the other thing that was introduced during Secret Wars was the idea that Magneto and God Loves Man Kills is the idea that Magneto was not such a bad guy. And during one um, book, he was went on trial for destroying a Russian submarine uh, in a story I believe we spoke about last time, uh, where he was found not guilty for some sort of technicality. He was guilty, but he was found not guilty just for story purposes. But there was a whole attack, and uh, Professor X was injured, and he had to go up to the Shi'ar. And at that point, he turned to him and said, I'm leaving the school to you, my friend. So the whole introduction of them being friends had been coming at this point. So Magneto was now the headmaster of Xavier's school, which was something that uh, people at the time were probably like, holy crap. Uh, it's a little bit like the Joker running the Batcave. It's pretty weird um but magneto becomes such a rounded character at this point i'm a big fan of this because i like magneto as a rounded character who, you know occasionally you, you have sympathy with he's not a real villain and, and it was good to see him on the team here i obviously have a firm as a villain and one of the main things is that his costume as a hero is well he got a better costume later on um but his first introduction that purple leotard with the cape with the giant m that was terrible <laughs> that is a horrible uh, costume. why he couldn't just have kept his villain costume i don't, I don't know. know um this was a, it was a horrible costume but at least he got a better one later on so magneto was headmaster of xavier's school uh i from what i've read uh I wish they could have done more with it, but what they did do with it, it was really good. Because they have him, Rachel Gray Summers at the time when she was on the X-Men was really, she was kind of aggressive with the Phoenix stuff, so she was threatening to kill people left and right. So when Magneto would show up, you would think like, oh man, is he going to help her kill these people? Or is he basically going to stop her? And you would have this really great character dynamics between Magneto and the students. And, you know, I, I've always wanted to see something like that done with Magneto and... They they did do some of that stuff in the comics at the time, so I was really happy for it. And I like this. I like the idea of Magneto being head of Xavier's for a little bit to see what the characters react to. Him. But yeah, it was good. Yeah, it, it was another ballsy move, you know. But uh, I I think it totally paid off. I I, I was a big fan of this because I'm a big Magneto fan. Uh, so it was cool to see, you know. Magneto in charge of the school and the way he does things uh, and it was also cool you know seeing a bit more of that friendship between uh, Charles and Eric it, it, it was really well done and um, and you know um, he was uh, there was the the head teacher of the X-Men and the new mutants and it, it was just a total change but um, I really liked it and you know, um, Magneto as, as a character, I just think has always been fascinating. And you know, I remember when there's the whole era of Magneto is right, and you know, looking on back, um, perhaps he was. You know, who knows? Mm -hmm. yeah. It was good stuff. Um, so then, uh, pretty soon after that, we went into a very different era, which a lot of people are fans of, and I I enjoyed it, but it was certainly a different take on the X Men where they were all killed, um, presumably, uh, during a whole magic thing with Forge, where Storm got her powers back and all this stuff. It all evolved into a case where they got killed, supposedly. And this, along with the fact that they had joined Magneto, was one of the reasons that X-Factor didn't get in touch with them for so long. There was a lot of reasons, for some reason, why they didn't. Um, but then they all saw them all yeah. die, and everybody thought that they thought everybody was... They thought that the X-Men were dead. Um, but in fact, they went to the Australian outback. And... Let me just... Okay. Um, yeah, the X-Men were all presumed dead. And they all went to the, actually went to the Australian outback. They met a character called Gateway, who was kind of their 
uh, an interesting character, but it was kind of a reason just to get to places. Um, and at this point, Havoc, Dazzler, and Longshot would be on the X-Men team. So a real B-list X-Men team at this point, as we were saying. But I think what Claremont was trying to do was say, okay, I've made these characters. Okay, but I'm going to put them off and shovel them. Colossus came back to the team, um, but Nightcrawler and Kitty never did. Uh, and then he said, I think that's probably because they didn't have another heavy hitter apart from Wolverine. And he just said, okay, well, I've made these characters popular, now I'm going to make these characters popular. And I don't think it worked. Um, I don't think Havoc, da- Dazzler, and Longshot ever became that popular. Uh, apart from maybe Dazzler, because she did have her own book, but I think... Graphic that, novel, too. I mean, yeah. So I think that Claremont was not exactly successful in what he was trying to do during this Australian era, but... It was at least something different, and uh, at this point there was an introduction of uh, Longshot and Dazzler as kind of love interests as well, and Rogue really became continually fleshed out and became, you know, totally a hero during this. She had more conflicts with the demons, with Carol Danvers and things like that. Um, so, X-Men in the Australian Outback era, thoughts? I don't know why they went to the Australian Outback, but, you know, it was different. It was... I, I can see what he was doing with the characters. I don't know too much from this era, but from what I know, it's it's it was different. It didn't work, but you know, got to give him props for trying to do something. No, I, it worked for story reasons. I just don't think it worked because his obvious intent was to make these B level characters as popular as the new char- as the new characters, and I don't think it worked. Yeah, it was it was different. I mean, Longshot's kind of popular with people, but he's not that popular. Dazzler, I don't think. It, is really ever going to get the recognition she deserves because, you know, she's she's basically a girl who is going on skates saying to people, lights show up, and I don't know. Her character didn't really interest me. And who else was it? Havoc? I think Havoc got popular from this. Yeah. Uh, Havoc got more popularity, but I think he's always been overshadowed by Cyclops. Yeah. Overall, for this little Australian outback thing, I don't know. It was... It, I'm just confused on it and I, yeah i don't know i enjoy i re, i enjoyed the stories a lot i enjoyed seeing the stuff of course we get the here the introduction of the reavers which would later include uh hell former hell fight club member donald pierce and lady Deathstrike, which we'll get into in a second um sort of a cyborg team where well, of course they, they'd also be silly members like the guy who had tank wheels for legs um <laughs> uh, but yeah ben your thoughts on the australian outback uh, yeah, I mean, I think I skipped over a bit of this era because, again, the characters were just, they weren't interesting. I've never, ever been a fan of Dazzler or Longshot. And, and you know, Havoc to me is just as bland and boring as Cyclops used to be. And uh, I can appreciate the idea of trying to make these characters more popular, but I can't help but feel it backfired. But, you know, there were good parts to it. You know, as you said, we got the Reavers, which was good. And, you know, there was the Inferno crossover, you know, which had the whole Madeline Pryor clone revelation. That was good. But I think that was around this era. But the whole Australian Outback era was just... Uh, yeah, Madeline Pryor went it. with them. I forgot about that. She went with them. And to get back at Cyclops, we started to see an evil side of her as she slept with Havoc. Uh, basically seduced him. Um, so that, yeah, there's no other real way to get back at your ex-husband than that, I think. Um, and we never really understood, we were like, where did the baby go? But uh, of course we'd find out later where the baby went. God, we'd find out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, during this other, this t- at the same time, over on X-Factor, we'd get the introduction of Apocalypse, um, who despite the big A on his chest and, and uh, things like that, I've always been a real big fan of because he's kind of like the dark side of the Marvel Universe and I, I really always really enjoyed the character at that point. The Four Horsemen and, of course, the evolution of Angel's character with Archangel. Um, Angel would never be the same again and we've certainly seen the effects of that, especially in books now, um, where he could change between the two and one personality is dominant over the other and things like that. So... Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Archangel. I'm a big fan of Apocalypse. He wasn't quite the overlord that he would become later on. Um, we had Ship and we had all these guys and the 
Four Horsemen and stuff, and yeah, I, I enjoyed it. It was thought it was good. I think at the beginning, like you said, Apocalypse wasn't the big bad guy he was, and you know, I really love Apocalypse, and I really wish you'd get more stories like he is now. But you know, looking back on his character, I think the only really big stories he had was the Archangel thing, Age of Apocalypse, and maybe some other quick story. But other than that, you know, he hasn't really had too many of those like world-changing events with the X-Men. He's just been like the bad guy who's just done occasional things. To him. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I love Apocalypse. I mean, I think he's a really cool villain. Um, um, but uh, agreed, he doesn't show up to, uh, show up too often. But when he does show up, I always think it's done really well. Um, so yeah, I, I loved um, the introduction of Apocalypse. It was cool. You know, we had the Horseman. I really loved it. Uh, and you know, he's become a really iconic villain. And you know, we had a lot of them thanks to this era. You know. Uh, apocalypse, uh, sinister, and, uh, and you know, seeing Nimrod. Yeah, so I, I liked it. Yeah, a lot of people kind of, you know, X Men purists, but not a fan of Archangel. They feel it's kind of a very nineties thing. But I think that Angel's popularity is down to Archangel because I think without oh, it, he's just a flying guy. Because I think without it, Angel's just another bland character on the team that wasn't really doing much. Like, he never did much until X-Factor. And even then, he wasn't really the prominent member of the team that stuff was going on with. So, uh, yeah, I think... He's kind of like that rich guy in the background who just pays for the stuff and just... Yeah, he was never he was never that interested in a character. And he was never that useful offensively because he was just, you know, a flying guy. So, I think... For like, the... like, now he's starting to become really interesting because of what Remender's doing and what happens yeah. in X-Factor. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, I was never a fan of him uh, until Archangel, you know. He was, like you said, just the rich guy in the background. You know, he was there, he flies, oh, big deal. But it, it really was the, the character progression he needed, you know. And having these, you know, inner demons, thanks to the transformation into Archangel. And, you know, it really uh, elevated, elevated him from being this bland character into a more prominent figure. And, it, you know, what the modern era has done with Cyclops now, um, for me, is is kind of similar you know cyclops for me i never ever liked him but you know the last 10 years or so it's improved him and and for me archangel did the same you know for angel's character so yeah yeah i think this is this was kind of and it's interesting there's a thing going on called the dark angel saga now i think this is did for angel what phoenix did for jean gray i think it gave her right. um that uh, as, as a fan of um star trek i'll bring up i think this is very similar to what happened to Captain Picard in that with the whole Lacute Saborg and all that kind of thing? I thought, you know, a, a guy changed him and that, all this stuff. And the fact that he was able to overcome it, I think it gave him much of a strength of will of character to say that the Warren Worthington personality overcame death, overcame Archangel. And he, you know, went back. Uh, and from that point onwards, he was always an edgy character from that point, but he rejoined the X Factor team as Archangel. So, um, you know, I, th I think he was a stronger character for it. Um, so then, pretty later on, as the whole background of Madeline Pryor be uh, reintroduced and uh, laid out, we get the introduction of Mr. Sinister. Um, now, Sinister looking at him, he's got a cool look, but it's an extremely mustache twiddling kind of villain look. <laughs> And, yeah. the re and the reason for that is because apparently the original idea for him was that he was supposed to be a manifestation of uh, Cyclops's nightmares of like what he thought a villain would be when he was a kid, which makes a lot of sense for the way that he looks. He kind of looks like Dracula meets, well, uh, a spider, really. Um, but <laughs> no, I, I, I'm a fan of Sinister, and once you get the backstory with him and Apocalypse and how he was Nathaniel Essex and his connection to Xavier and all that stuff, I, I, you know, I'm a biggest sinister fan I'm, i enjoy him yeah, i i wish okay go ahead yeah. uh, no i'll let you go first if you like um uh, i really wish i could see like more of those other like big mind altering stories like i said the populace with sinister but i think the only big one with sinister too is inferno and uh, age of apocalypse and some of the more recent stuff has happened uh other than that you know i really like sinister and i don't the only, the only my uh, bad job with Sinister is like I don't understand why he's, he has his big obsession with uh, Cyclops in the first place, but it did add some more interesting things with him and Cyclops. So yeah, I think it's more interesting. But he has this uh, idea that 
Jean Grey and Cyclops DNA combined could make the most powerful mutant ever, which we'd find out in Age of Apocalypse, would be called X Men. Oh. Um, ben, what about you, Sinister? Yeah, Sinister's probably one of my favourite X Men villains of all time. And, you know, I, I'm so disappointed the movies haven't used him yet because I think he's amazing. He's a real, he's like the personification of evil. Uh, so, you know, it's interesting when you say, you know, that it's kind of the manifestation of Scott's nightmares. I mean, you know, he's helped to develop, develop Scott's character a lot. And, um, you know, the whole cloning gene to make the Goblin Queen, uh, I really liked that. Um, and, you know, I, I liked his backstory, you know, uh, like, as you mentioned, you know, he was Nathaniel Essex, um, who I think was born in the 19th century. And, you know, so he's been around a long time and he just, uh, he, his appearances have always been great. And, um, you know, he's continued to do so. And, um, I, I loved him more recently in Messiah Complex, um, but he's just been a real iconic X Men villain. And um, whilst yeah, um, I, I don't think that his obsession with Scott has been uh, clear. I know a lot of people have always been a bit unsure about that, but nonetheless, as I said, I've, I think it's been good development for both him and um, and Scott. Yep. Um, so very quickly, uh, any can, I, can, I just quick, can I just quickly add? Um, um, am I think right in thinking that um, uh, Sinister had something to do with the legacy virus as well? Or, or yes, he like did. He he and some scientists like accidentally opened it up, and like apparently he was tricked into opening it, and he released the legacy virus and That's right. killed I thought so. Oh, cool. Uh, all right, so very quickly, um, I mean, man, we've gone way longer than usual and we continue to because it's so, just thinking about it, how many stories, how much was introduced during this decade is insane. Um, More and, happened here than most of the others that have happened. In, in yeah, now. exactly. I mean, nowadays we all just go back to this stuff, but just how much of the X-Men was created during this decade is insane. Um, how much has become popular. Um, speaking of which, very quickly, anybody got any thoughts on Lady Deathstrike? I think she's one of the few people that can actually frighten Wolverine because, you know, I, I've, what, I've read, what I've read, she she can basically kick his ass really easily and, you know, she's almost, she's basically unkillable like Wolverine except she's faster, she's more, she's, I think she's even stronger. She, be, she can basically just annihilate him and take him out really easily. So, yeah, I like her. I think she's another one of those villains, again, we'd get the introduction of the whole backstory with Sabretooth and stuff like that, that would be connected to Wolverine's past, and I think that added a dimension to her. She was like a lover who, uh, you find out that she was connected to the guy who turned Wolverine into Adamantium Skeleton, Wolverine killed him, so she hates him, and mm. all this sort of stuff, and again, this revenge plot, it gave a very personal edge to... The, but the, why did she, how did she get all that stuff on her? Like the, uh, the Reavers took her and changed her um she was oh. like like the reason she can survive the adamantium is because she was basically turned into half a cyborg oh okay no oh that she's not even a mutant yeah ben yeah she she's okay um i mean she's it was good to see um you know a real match for wolverine an actual threat for him and someone who could who could equal him if not best him and it was interesting as well for that character to be a woman too so uh that was cool um but um i, I don't know um I, I want to like her more than i do i don't dislike her but she's okay but uh agreed uh the the backstory uh that she has her connections uh, with uh, with Logan um, that did add a lot more depth to the character uh, but she's she's okay in my eyes she's not bad but she's not great I, I'm more of a Sabretooth fan yeah so speaking in the same vein uh, at this point we you know Sabretooth was introduced during Mew to Masca, but then um, the character was starting to be fleshed out we get the whole backstory of old soldiers and things like that we would reveal the past and the, you know, at this point he really became Wolverine's arch nemesis. Uh, we've got the whole backstory with Silver Fox and all that stuff that's in the Origins movie to a point. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, the introduction of Sabretooth as Wolverine's arch nemesis. I think it's perfect. I don't really have much to say about it, but I just think it's it just fits. You know? All this stuff that's happened to them in the past and stuff that's happening now. Like, isn't, isn't Sabretooth dead now? 
I think just about all the X-Men villains apart from like two are dead. <laughs> I'm not oh, even geez. joking. Yeah. But yeah, he's just a great little villain for Wolverine. I just think, you know, yeah, he just, just he should have stayed there, but now he's dead. So poor Wolverine. Yeah, as as I said, um, if you were to give me Lady Deathstrike or Sabretooth, I'd choose uh, Sabretooth every time. Um, I, I like the long-running uh, rivalry um, that he has with Logan. I like the backstory. Um, and it was interesting, you know, um, back when they were on, uh, I think it was the Team X, you know, with like uh, Maverick and Silver Fox, that whole backstory. Uh, it, it was great. And... Um, it, he's kind of like the cautionary tale uh, of Wolverine, kind of like what Wolverine could have ended up like. Uh, and he, he just is the perfect enemy for him. He just, he's really, really cool. Um, it, and it's just a shame that the uh, the first X-Men movie uh, had to ruin that. Yeah, he made him like a bumbling bodyguard type of guy. Didn't really mm-hmm. do much. If you take the look of Sabretooth from the first movie and the character from Origins, put them together, you get the real Sabretooth. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, all right then, so then the Goblin Queen, Madeline Pryor, became a big villain. As we said, it was kind of an out to forgive Cyclops so he, so he didn't have to deal with the problems. Uh, we get revealed that she was, the reason she looks like you get so much is because Sinister cloned her. And it was all to get into Cyclops because he wanted to use his DNA and he wanted to create X-Man, or at least he did in the other timeline, and all this other stuff. And Madeline went nuts because of what Cyclops did to her. Um, continued to get darker and darker and then eventually became this big villain with demons around her and we also at this point during Inferno uh, the X-Mansions burnt down again uh, but really <laughs> from this point onwards I think this was the last time we'd ever see the X-Mansion uh, the classic X-Mansion with the three tiers and the the uh, kind of um, the can't think of the word the, the pillars stuff on the top the, the classic X-Mansion never came back after this I don't think um, so that was burnt down and uh we found out what happened to uh, Cyclops' son, Christopher, was sent into the future, and we'd see him later on as Cable. So, your thoughts on Inferno and Madeline Pryor and stuff. For me, I think it turned Madeline into a very one-note villain, and it was a kind of very one-note story, and I think it was just an out to not only... Not only to please fanboys with that were unhappy that Jean was not connected to the Phoenix, because late because at the end of the story she merged with Madeline and Phoenix and all stuff, so they all became one character. And I think it was an out for that reason. And the second reason was an it was an out to get Cyclops off the hook for leaving her. Uh, and it also brought us Cable, so that could, that's another curse upon it. But uh, I like Cable, I, I like him later on, but. The Rob Liefeld years, I think he, I think he's always tainted by that for me. Oh yeah, like the huge, he's like eight feet with like giant. If you ever, shoulders. everybody who ever says about '90s artwork and pouches and all that stuff, Cable is the personification of that, and I think he's never got away from that. To be honest, I like him a lot better than Strife. I'll tell you that much. Man. Oh God. Uh, Jesus. <laughs> but Ben, That's your, not about Strife. <laughs> your yeah. thoughts on Inferno? Oh, I liked Inferno, um, maybe because. Um, in, instead of you know making Madeline more of the villain, it really just improved even more upon Sinister for me. He showing just really how well Sinister he is. You know, this great plan he's had, um, you know, to to get to Scott. It, it was cool, but I, I can totally see where you're coming from when you're saying you know it was just an out to get people to forgive you know Scott for what he was doing. But it was cool, and um, you know, seeing uh, Madeline become the the Goblin Queen, and you know, lashing out. I liked that, and I, I really liked the end as well. When, uh, when Cyclops just cuts loose, and you know, he just like blasts Sinister to you know to like a smouldering wreck. It, it was great, um, but um, it, it was interesting. But. Um, Again, it did give us Cable, which I'll never forgive because I've never, ever, ever liked Cable, with the possible really? exception of with the possible exception of Cable in Deadpool. But um, yeah, have, it, you read, that, have you read Second Coming yet? Yeah, he's really uh, good there, and I think the stuff that happened later on and yeah, in X Force, he got better. I think but, the yeah. stuff that happened with him once he got teamed up with um, with Hope, I think that was probably my favorite stuff of Cable. But, um, uh, and I'm not going to spoil it if you haven't read Second Coming, but uh, yeah, you won't have to worry about Cable anymore. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, Jeff Lowe, but yeah. so you never know. Yeah. Um, 
I agree with you though, just saying that um, Madeline did become sort of like a one shot kind of villain, you know, a one trick pony at following it. But I understand why it was done. My uh, favorite but... thing about this was that we finally got X Factor and X Men on the same page. I was like, Jesus Christ, finally! Uh, <laughs> and, you know, Wolverine kissing Jean. Or that was good. There was some good character stuff during this. I'll say that. Um, yeah. I haven't read the book, so I can't really comment. So we can just, you know. Okay. Go on to the next thing. Uh, all right, then. So uh, as we finish up the 80s here, um, the X-Men started to... I think they carried on in Australia, but the final character introduced was the poor man's Kitty Pride. but she is popular on her own right, and I do... I think I'm tainted on her because of the 90s series and the characterization of her there, but I do enjoy her kind of now, even though she's a vampire or whatever. I, I've got one question about Jubilee. Uh Whose bright idea was it that her power should be fireworks? <laughs> Same person who created Dazzler, I'd imagine. Uh, <laughs> of using fireworks as a power. I don't I'm not understand. Sure they even sure what. I, sometimes Jubilee's powers can blast holes in walls. Sometimes it can barely dent things. It does. I'm not even that sure they know what her powers are. Um, this hey, book. Chris, do you know what, what we're going to do today? What we're going to create today is like we're going to make this little teenage girl shoot out fireworks. Yeah, she was the personification of a late 80s, early 90s kid. And for that reason, she really, that's why she, she's remained sort of popular with our generation because of the 90s cartoon. Um, but even for me, she was always sort of the annoying character, but I much prefer Kitty Pride. Uh, yeah. But, I, but I'm a, I like her now. I, when she shows up, it's like, oh, Jubilee. I'm not I'm not anti-Jubilee. I just think the characterization here is extremely annoying. The way she talks. It's like Claremont's like, he's this old man who's trying to talk as the, the lingo of the kids of the time. If you read it, it's like, oh. It's kind of like if a, uh, if, a, if one of our dads are rapped. It's kind of, yeah. That's, <laughs> yes, that's I think the, the only thing I really know about Jubilee is that she can't really do math. Is that right? Well, I apparently, know. I was looking at some trivia game on like one of the X Men games I was playing. It said like Jubilee apparently can't do math, and that's like the only really was that trying to, she can't do. Was that trying to get rid of the stereotype because she's Asian? <laughs> 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 yeah, that that's that's kind of ironic. But yeah, I didn't know she was Asian. Yeah, I know they don't draw her as Asian now. When you first see her, she looks Chinese, but nowadays, you know. She occasionally looks Chinese. It's kind of like Psylocke, you know. Sometimes the eyes don't look Chinese at all, or Japanese or whatever. Um, That's the way art goes. You just don't know who they are anymore. But yeah. Yeah, but guys, uh, Jubilee. Yeah, yeah. I think I've already said my piece about her. I, I don't know. She's she's got a raincoat and stuff. I, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I, I didn't mind her in the 90s series, but the comic books, again, she, she was annoying. And it just, you know, you got it spot on when they said poor man's Kitty Pride because, you know, they kind of repeated things, you know, like her, you know, father, daughter kind of figure shit with Logan. And, you know, I don't know. I've just never warmed to it. I wouldn't say I hate her and I'm like, oh, no, Jubilee. But Jubilee is one of these characters who, for me, she's just there i've never felt she's really had the chance to be fleshed out enough we've never i, I don't know she may have potential but I, I don't think we've ever seen something amazing from jubilee absolutely um and the one last thing that would happen in the 80s would the storm would as the punk i guess went out of fashion storm grew her hair back and went to kind of a Miss Marvel-looking costume, which would kind of be the prototype of what she'd wear during the Jim Lee run. So uh, Storm returned to a classic look, which was good. Um, so that pretty much does it for the 80s. Um, it really leads into the stuff that would happen in the 90s where the teams would merge back together. Um, but, yeah, guys, any final thoughts on the X-Men in the 1980s? And I think the fact that we went you know, nearly two hours on... <laughs> uh, on, on this shows how much there is to talk about how much of the X-Men that is just so much of the X-Men was introduced during the 80s it is insane but uh, I really enjoy the 80s X-Men uh, I, I put it on par which is you know the 70s and the 80s you got the most stuff done like I said my last point but I think this is also the time where the art was probably the most influential part of this you got guys like uh, Paul Smith, Jim Lee, Mark Silvestri, John Romita Jr. even 
just all these really Sinkiewicz great artists. Sienkiewicz is the one from New Mutants you wrote about, isn't it? Oh, yeah, Sienkiewicz. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. Like, his, actually, his art was, like, the craziest because they have him, like... Oh, yeah, I forgot about people. Warlock. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Warlock, the robot from space. Yeah, it was weird. But you have all these different art... The, the art definitely defined the era of the books. It definitely... Like all, like, all these guys were, like, brand new at the time, and nobody really knew who these guys were. Like, Jeremy Jr. was, like, a nobody at the time. Well, he did stuff before, but he was basically, like, who is this guy? And he became more pop. All these artists became more popular because of these books... And I think I've already said a piece about the characters. We've all said a piece about the characters becoming different, more interchangeable, uh, just almost already fl- fl- like fully fleshed out because of these stories. Uh, but yeah, honestly, I think the, the 80s is one of my favorites uh, for the X-Men. And, you know, I think this is, when, this is them in their prime, and then the 90s came along, the early 90s came along, and then it just, they kind of died down, and the Avengers took over. But yeah, that's about it. Yeah, ag- agreed. I mean, DH is probably one of my absolute favourite eras for the X-Men. It was just a great time. We had great stories, really great artwork, um, uh, ballsy moves, as we've mentioned. You know, um, you know the writers weren't afraid to take risks and change things up. And, um, you know, we had all these spin-offs and, you know, the X-Men just boomed and, you know, there's been so much stuff that we've covered and I'm sure there's stuff that, you know, we probably haven't too, but, you know, it just gave us such a good, um, you know, source material and it's the era that a lot of people will look back to and and say, you know, this was X-Men at its best, you know, and we had some really, you know, iconic uh, moments and we had a lot of dark moments and, you know, we had characters like, you know, Kitty and Rogue sinister all introduced who you know have become icons you know you know of the series um so yeah for me it's one of the absolute best it's uh, it's x-men on top form um but uh, as i said earlier uh, the 90s for me was the the slow decline but the 80s was great and you know it looking at the 80s it's hard to believe that x-men was ever cancelled you know back uh, in the 60s so yeah i love it for me, this is the best era of the X-Men. The best decade overall. I mean, 70s introduced a lot, but man, just where would the X-Men be without Mystique, Sabretooth, Rogue, Kitty Pride, Dark Phoenix, Archangel? Just everything we've covered here is just so much of what the X-Men is, so much of what everybody thinks of when they think of X-Men. Wolverine as the badass samurai. Just everything right. was introduced here. And, uh, you know, for the most part, and I think that... For that reason, it has to go down as the best decade. I mean, yes, it had its off points. Yes, it had its weird points. But overall, it is just the era that made the X-Men who they are. And for that reason, it has to be the best era. Uh, if you want to read a decade of the, X- of the X-Men, I go out and say, read some of the last moments of the 70s, and then just hit the 80s, because, man, does it get good. I found a couple of lists on Amazon that showed like an entirely graphic novel or just like trade paperback section of like each or just get the essential X-Men stuff. That's the best way to get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, then. So we'll be back next time to talk about the 90s, uh, a decade that began with a cool new hip look with Jim Lee and declined into strife, the nasty boys. <laughs> Oh, jeez. Phalanx Covenant. We're going to have fun with all of that stuff. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. I will say this right now. I'm going to have to do my research because the 90s is the, is the era I know the least about. Because what I did was, on word of mouth, I stopped reading in 1992 and waited until Grant Morrison's run. Because I'm pretty, because from what I was told, from 92 until 2002... X Men sucked. So, <laughs> so yeah. apart from Age of Apocalypse, which we'll cover, I haven't. Read I much. think the only two good parts of the '90s were like Fabian Nicieza, if you guys know who that is. Oh mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, Scott Lobdell. I, yeah. I know. I know Scott Lobdell is. Yeah, he's he's okay nowadays. But the '90s, I think he was like one of the few guys actually holding the X Men to the good point for a couple stories. But yeah, yeah overall, the '90s just oh god. For me. Um, the only good point coming up about the nineties was Rogue and Gambit and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. But we'll yeah. get uh but we'll get into that when we get oh, into the Magneto thing with the Adamantium. Oh so. yeah, Magneto becomes a villain again. So which we did which we didn't cover, but Jory Inferno, Magneto becomes a villain again. Thank God. Get us oh, right. yeah. 
crappy costume. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for joining us here on the Decade by Decade 80s Roundtable. I'll, again, see what, what I can do to get uh, uh, Cap Logan and Eric and guys like that on for the next one. And We promised them like eight times, and we've never brought them on. I think, it, <laughs> I think we're just scamming these guys over. Yeah, well... Yeah. We, no, we're not, <laughs> well... I have to tell you, the last time Eric was ready to go, but for some reason Skype said he wasn't online, so he would have been on the last one, but oh well. Um, But we'll get to the 90s, I'm pretty sure, no matter how many of us, it's going to be a bitching session. Uh, (laughs) Because all you have to do is look at the art of the 90s to know why. So Uh, that's... I don't want to talk about life, (laughs) though. We're going to, we're going to. Uh, So (laughs) that will do it for the 80s. Catch you later.